As the sum of each generation before it, the next generation Corvette stands alone. As the new standard of precision and performance, of engineering and technology, of everything that makes an icon an icon, and a Corvette a Corvette. Welcome to the Bladed Tech Channel, the home for retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. Fellow YouTubers Tavarish, Tyler Hoover, and Ed Bolian were recently commissioned by car search aggregator Auto Tempest to find three used exotic cars equal to or less money than it would cost to buy a new 2020 Chevrolet Corvette C8. The Corvette C8 is, by all accounts, a real marvel of design and engineering crammed into an affordable package. For the price of a well-equipped pickup truck, anybody can buy an exotic car experience without the exotic price tag. Thus, Auto Tempest's objective was to challenge Ed, Tyler, and Freddy to find a set of truly exotic cars that would match the C8's combination of value and performance. The difficulty in this challenge is that candidates could not be so high mileage as to be mechanically unreliable or excessively worn, or low mileage as to be too pricey, and resorting to the purchase of an older C7 or Dodge Charger, which were built by the hundreds of thousands, would be by definition mean the candidate would not be exotic. But I can tell you there is one exceedingly rare, exceptionally well-engineered, handcrafted, low-production sports car not one of them even considered in their search. Not only can you get this car for far less money than a $70,000 reasonably equipped C8, you could buy two. In fact, if mint condition was not required, a low mileage example could be bought several times over. And this car is only a little older than the Ferrari that Hoovy picked as his entry in car trick. How is it possible for a rare sports car in good condition to not only cost less than the C8, would be essentially not worth more than its parts or scrap value. And why wouldn't any of the participants in the Auto Tempest CA Challenge have picked it as a viable option? Stay tuned to find out. Between 1973 and 1985, Detroit's Big Three, General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford, designed and manufactured some of the crappiest cars in the history of the automobile industry. Cost mattered more than design, obsolescence was an intentional feature, and quality was a joke. This situation was aptly assessed by Jeremy Clarkson in the popular British TV show Top Gear, a link to which is provided below. Early signs this was about to change arrived with the appearance of the Pontiac Fiero in 1984. The Fiero was a mid-engine sports coupe that was dramatically different than any other domestic model at that time and had more in common with Italian and German sports cars, at least from an outward appearance. We covered the Fiero in episode 16, a link to which can be found below. In 1985, Ford introduced the Taurus, arguably the design that pushed Detroit to shake free of its 1970s design doldrums and start making interesting and reliable cars again. Ford followed the success of the Taurus with other innovative designs for all three of its nameplates, and Chrysler finally followed suit several years later by ditching the K-Car platform and developing its Cab Ford LH platform. General Motors, which suddenly found itself under assault from Ford and Chrysler on one side and Japanese car makers on the other, struggled to adapt. Despite its novelty in the GM lineup, the Fiero only sold more than 50,000 units in a single year once, leading to its cancellation in 1989. And the Fiero was never intended to be a performance sports car. GM had the Chevy Corvette, after all. But GM's luxury nameplates Buick and Cadillac, themselves losing sales to BMW and Mercedes-Benz, in addition to their problems with Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, and Nissan, wanted their own performance coupe. Cadillac got its wish in the form of a Pininfarina built body laid over a V variant of the E platform. 
that car became the Elante, a sports coupe that ultimately managed just a bare fraction of the Fiero's sales, despite being sold for two years longer. Even worse, the Elante couldn't even come close to the sales numbers of the car it was really meant to compete with, the Mercedes-Benz 560 SL, despite having a somewhat cheaper sticker and a significantly newer design. General Motors finally agreed to allow Buick to design its own sports car, but not with the same freedoms that Cadillac enjoyed. While Cadillac built its Elante bodies in an Italian factory and shipped them to Michigan in specially modified Boeing 747s, Buick engineers had to save money on tooling and manufacturing by refurbishing an abandoned factory in Detroit. While Cadillac got to design its own unique chassis, Buick was forced to use the same ancient E-platform that most of the company's staid sedans were using. While Cadillac designed a completely new interior for the Elante, Buick was ordered to use the Buick Riviera's interior. In fact, the new Buick sports car also shared much of its mechanical package with the 1986-1987 Buick Riviera. Despite its smaller size and the use of injection molded plastic for the front fenders, the new car was not significantly lighter than the Riviera, tipping the scales at little under 3,400 pounds. Suspension was largely identical, with struts at all four wheels and a transverse leaf spring in the rear. Also used was the Riviera's venerable 231 cubic inch V6 linked to a four-speed automatic transmission. The V6 made 165 horsepower, which was just enough to push the Riviera and its sportier sibling from zero to 60 miles per hour in a bit under 10 seconds. The top speed was electronically limited to 122 miles per hour. Buick called its new sports car the Riata and was to be the last significant design by the division's engineers which were moved out of Buick shortly thereafter. Most insiders in General Motors thought that Buick would never get approval to go into production with the Riata. Even after Buick got their green light from top management, executives at Cadillac, Pontiac, and Chevrolet noted privately that there wasn't any available production capacity to build the new model. But Buick solved this problem too, going into limited production at the discarded factory it had used to build the prototypes. There was a brief flurry of public interest when the Riata went on sale in January of 1988, but total sales for the first shortened model year were not impressive. The tally was only 4,700, well short of Buick's original target. The Riata's first full model year in 1989 was a much better. 1990 was the Riata's best year, but that still meant only 8,500 sales. Even before the 1991 models debuted in the fall of 1990, it was clear that the Buick Riata was going nowhere. Buick reluctantly acceded to its cancellation judging the Riata lost cause. 1991 sales were only 1,500 cars. In the end, total Riata production for four model years was 21,751, well short of the 22,000 a year Buick once projected, although better than the Elante despite its longer run. Interestingly, the Riata's demise did not immediately mean the end of its unusual production facility, which was renamed the Lansing Craft Center. The Craft Center would be eventually tasked to build the General Motors' first modern electric car, the GM EV1. So some of you are probably wondering how a 165 horsepower 1990 sports coupe that was the stepchild of General Motors could possibly stand up to the Ferrari Lamborghini and Aston Martin that Tavares, Bolian, and Hoovy picked for their exotic competition to the Corvette C8. And for those of you who are so wondering, our guess is that you have never even seen a Buick Riata, never mind ever heard of one. Because the fact is, the Riata is a beautiful sports car, worthy of the moniker exotic in just about every way. The Riata's design has simple, clean lines a subtly rounded profile featuring a slightly pointed nose with hidden headlamps, a grille tucked under the front bumper and a short tucked in tail. It was not unlike an American Jaguar XKE from the 1960s. Today it looks, if not contemporary, then at least timeless. The Riata's design is so clever that its structural kinship to the contemporary Riviera is not readily apparent. The only indication of its e-body heritage is the pronounced front overhang. 
The Riata is actually 7 inches longer than a C4 Corvette. The Buick Riata's full-width light panel taillights were inspired by the rear treatment of the contemporary Porsche 911. Requiring 14 light bulbs, they were nearly rejected on cost grounds. Keeping the Riata's price within reason was a major challenge for Buick. Significantly more costly was the late model convertible option for the Riata, an option that increased the car's sticker to $35,000, an eye-popping amount when considering a convertible Chrysler LeBaron was $20,000, but merely modest as compared to a $60,560 SL. The Riata was zippy with the Riviera V6, but not exotic. If this was bothersome, Buick offered in the last model years a turbo option that boosted the horsepower to 245. There's also a plethora of aftermarket parts to further boost the Buick LM3 or L27 engine. Granted, Tyler's Ferrari 360 has 394 horsepower, Tavares's Aston Martin has 430 horsepower, and Bolian's Lamborghini Gallardo has 490 horsepower. But all three could be legitimately taken to the track, where they would fall behind the 495 horsepower Corvette C8. Our final note on Car Trek and the Buick Riata is that Auto Tempest tilted the contest in favor of vehicle condition and total acquisition cost. This is where a mint condition turbocharged convertible Riata would shine. It would be both cheaper than Tyler's Ferrari and look better than Tavares' Aston Martin. As for Bolian's flood damage Gallardo, well, that speaks for itself. What do you think of the Buick Riata? Did it deserve consideration in Auto Tempest's Corvette C8 inspired competition? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this look back at the Riata and of Tavares, Bolian's, and Hoovy's Car Trek YouTube series. If so, click that like button. Clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell icon will also help you stay informed when new episodes are released. Links to previous vehicle industry related episodes and our other content can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching! Introducing an automobile that will change the way you think about two-seaters. Riata by Buick, the premium American two-seater you can be comfortable with. Riata offers a high level of luxury, sophisticated conveniences, and a remarkable amount of room at a most attractive price. If your aim in life has always been high, drive the premium American two-seater. Riata by Buick. Go ahead. You deserve it.